pattern matching is sort of at the heart of everything that uh, we'll be covering. Um, and you can't sort of get through life without pattern matching. We have some innate patterns that are built in. So things like suckling, babies in the womb will make suckling reflexes before they're even born because it's something they're gonna need. Obviously they won't get very far if they can't suckle when they come out. Um, so there are some things that are just innate patterns. They're built in, you will, you'll have them from before birth and um, they obviously develop further based on your experiences after birth. So we all have an inbuilt pattern ready to learn language, for example, but it's very open, it's very flexible so that it doesn't matter what language you're born into, you can learn language, you can pick up the structure. You know, no one sits down with a baby and goes through textbooks and um, you know, writes on a board what words you need to say or anything. And everyone knows how hard it is to learn a language when you're far more grown up it's really difficult to learn a language uh, at the same rate that babies do, yet babies master it with no lessons at all. Uh, you know, they get the accents right, they get everything right, and they manage to master it all. And it only comes because they've got the pattern there, but patterns are always metaphorical, so they're always loose and able to be built on and able to apply to lots of things. So babies are born with the pattern to be able to recognise faces, literally any face at all. It could be two cows, it could be two pigs, it could be two humans. They can recognize the difference between any face at all, but knowing that two pigs look different to each other doesn't have much um, evolutionary sort of sense. So by the age of about two-ish, babies or 18 months or so, babies stop being able to do that um, unless they've got uh, some kids, say with Asperger's and things like that, sometimes have it that that part of the brain doesn't get cut. So normally it gets cut and the brain gets used for other things um, but under some conditions that doesn't get cut and then you still end up years later sort of when you're uh, a young child and then a teenager or whatever you still have this bizarre talent at being able to recognize things that ordinarily everyone else has grown out of because those patterns just aren't needed and yet you seem to have retained that pattern matching ability for those things so we have lots of innate patterns Sometimes they can be faulty already. It's quite rare, but uh, for most people, you would you would normally know if a pattern is naturally faulty. It would be so fundamental to your being that you'd probably have very clear signs. So most people you encounter, like in therapy and stuff, don't have an innate pattern that was born faulty. They have patterns that they've learned faulty as time goes on. So um, uh, obviously phobias their faulty pattern matching. You see a spider, for example, and you feel fear. You don't have to feel fear when you see a spider. There's plenty of people out there that see spiders without feeling fear, but someone who sees a spider and feels fear has set up that pattern matching ability. They've misused it and it's gone wrong somewhere. Something's happened that made them get the wrong outcome. Well, say wrong, there's no, no reason why it is wrong. It could be right, it could be spiders are dangerous, but. Um, in most situations, it, it's thought that that would be the wrong pattern match. There are some spiders that are dangerous. Over here, there's not too many. Um, but some countries, it's sensible to not go prodding spiders too much um, or chasing them. I chase spiders around with cameras all the time. Um, and the closest we've got to a dangerous spider is the false widow, I think, mm. which mm. just would hurt unless you're allergic. Um, and I've chased a few of them around taking photos. Uh, while everyone else is running the other way. Um, but generally, most problems happen because of faulty pattern matching on to some extent or another. So um, pattern matching works through, as I will give you in this, I'll give for you now. Um, this is something you're gonna do in a minute, but I'll give it to you because when you've got it in front of you, uh, works through what he has written down as the set model. So anyone that's read my books will know about the APEC model, Activating Agent Pattern Matching Emotion Thought. Um, I thought that partly because of doing what the exercise is you're going to do, um, that having the pattern matching part written down just got in the way because you could never put anything physical in that box. So as a therapist, when I've had clients, especially clients that I'm thinking, I don't even know where to begin with you. I've written down using uh, pattern matching. I've written down, okay, what's the cause of this? So what's the stimulus? 
So in, on the old thing, what was the activating agent? What is the pattern match? And then I thought, well, I can't write anything. What do you write for what the pattern match is? There's nothing you can write in that box. But what emotion has come out the other end and what thought has come off the back of that emotion? Um, so I've used this model as a way of just when you get stuck, how do you get to the pattern of the problem rather than get bogged down in the content? When you, know, you sit down with somebody and they say, uh, oh, my mum did this and my brother did that and uh, my uncle did this and my cousin did that and you'll never guess when this person did. And they tell you all this stuff. People love telling stories and love filling you with loads and loads of content, most of which has no relevance at all to helping them get better. It, it's just stuff that, they, that goes around in their head. Because it goes around in their head, they get tied up with it and they get hooked on it and they obsess about it and they, they focus on all of these things that go around. But they're not the bits that lead to the solution. The solution is, you know, what, what is the pattern of this? How are you doing this? How are you managing to keep yourself in this place of having this problem? Um, and I found it's more streamlined, just thinking set model. So you have a stimulus, normally starts as an external stimulus but can become an internal one. So um, say anxiety, public speaking. So you know, I am about to walk out to, uh, or no, I am seeing my diary that I've got to give a, pub, a talk. So seeing that in your diary makes you then feel a sense of anxiety. You feel the sense of anxiety and then you start thinking, oh my God, what if they all hate me? What you, whatever the thoughts are off the back of that. Then it can cycle round. So the thoughts now become the new stimulus. So you tell yourself, oh my God, what if they do this? What if they do that? What if they all hate me? What if they start throwing tomatoes at me? Whatever, you know, whatever you're thinking. That then makes you feel worse again. And because you feel worse, you then think even worse again. And then you get stuck on that emotion and thought cycle that seems to just not end. But what you want, obviously, as a therapist is, what's the initial trigger? So if you break it at that point, you're breaking it a bit late because the trigger keeps happening. So if you don't break the initial, the gap between the initial trigger and that first emotion, so that it gets to a better, healthier emotion, you keep being stuck in that cycle. Um, and a lot of things like CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, works on the thinking to try and change the feeling but normally it's working on the thinking that's happened after the thing has triggered the thinking. So something has triggered the feeling that's triggered the thinking. And then you try and treat the thinking, which is now triggering the, the feeling again, which would trigger the thinking again. But you never get to treat what originally caused it in the first place. And so you get stuck on this cycle of therapy is made harder because you're almost trying to treat something at the end, it's like, you know, you're trying to control a lion by hanging onto its tail. It's, you know, really, you need to be at the front end and controlling its head, because as long as the front end is still active, it's likely to do some harm. <clears throat> so it's how do you get to what the original cause was? And that doesn't mean cause like necessarily going back to childhood. It, it's just what is the cause? What's the pattern? So what's the cause? What makes you have this happen over and over again? So um, it could be the first time the pattern happened was... You stood up at a school play and you know, your dad said to you, you're stupid, you're never going to amount to anything, you're rubbish, that, you know, that sounded horrible, you did terrible, they make you feel really bad. That might be the cause, but the fact is, because of that, the pattern is, when I stand up, I instantly feel bad because that had happened, that was an emotional event. So that pattern was formed and the more, the more powerful the emotion is, the easier it is to form a pattern. So phobias are a brilliant example of learning because a phobia, something happens to you once and you never forget, you know, years and years later. In fact, you can not see, say you've got fear of spiders, you can not see a spider for about 20, 30, 40 years. But the second you do, you know you're supposed to be scared of it. You've learned that, you mastered that years ago. So it, even, despite all that time elapsing, it was such an emotional event that you've got it again. Uh, likewise with good learning, you know, if someone teaches you something and suddenly it gives you a rush of emotion and makes you feel really good or really excited about it, that sticks, that bit of information among whatever else was going on sticks because it was it stood out so much above everything else that was going on. And even months later, that's the bit you're going to recall because that's the bit that had that high level of emotion, whereas low level of emotion you have to keep, which is why trainers that can make you laugh all the time, so virtually keep you laughing through a whole course. When you think of the training and you laugh, you re recall everything again because it's associated with that happiness and that laughter. 
<clears throat> so the stronger the emotion, the less repetitions it needs. So the same goes for the therapeutic side. So it goes for problem forming and for therapy forming. The problem forming, strong emotion, probably only takes one or two goes. You, know, you get thumped in the face once and you don't like it. You may remember that lesson fairly quickly. Um, you see a TV advert and it's a low level of emotion. It doesn't really stimulate you much. It takes a lot of watching that advert for the advert to start impacting on you. Um, unless the advert tricks you by having a pattern in it that doesn't complete, like the McDonald's one with um, the sort of tune. It started out as Justin Timberlake singing a chunk of song. Then it got down to just a whistle and everyone knows what the sentence is that comes from the end of the whistle. Um, that knows the McDonald's ad, that it's, I'm loving it. And it specifically says, I'm loving it, not you're loving it. So that you tell yourself when it doesn't finish the sentence, um, you say to yourself, I'm loving it, meaning McDonald's. So uh, it's a very good way of tricking you into uh, liking their product. Um, hopefully people then think, I don't like being tricked and I don't like their product. But, um, but it is a very good way of tricking you into it. It, it doesn't complete the pattern so if you know the pattern because it completed it to start with to make sure you'd learnt the pattern, when it then doesn't complete it, like any other song you know, or any jingle or something, or if um, like how we learn the alphabet over here is through rhyming. So A, B, C, D, and everyone just goes to themselves, E, F, G, in their head. So everyone repeat carries it on the pattern because it's not been completed. Or someone goes, twinkle, twinkle, and goes, little star. So anything that's not completed, we go and complete it instead. So that's a way sort of to trick this, a way around this is um, if you need to get an outcome and uh, you don't have strong emotion to do it, don't complete what you're doing. Um, the same goes for, which will be taught in the Ericsson hypnosis section, hypnosis techniques. One of them is not completing sentences. So you start saying something and then you stop and people just carry on they say what's coming next to themselves and then they give it as an embedded command to themselves because you didn't say it whereas if you said it they probably ignore you because you've said it and so why should they do what you say so um not completing patterns is obviously one good way of tricking someone around this instead of using the set model is tricking someone into getting that completion and uh, even if you don't have high emotion um so with clients if you can propose an idea and then frustrate it oh no you're not ready yet I don't think you'd be able to do it yet and you don't complete it and then, what what idea what are you talking about and then you keep sort of hinting at things and you just you slowly get to the point they're so ripe for receiving it when you get there because you didn't give it to them um, a bit like most tv shows uh, end with a cliffhanger at the end of the week because they know that way you'll watch the first one the next week because you can't even if you don't like the show once you start, like, I don't like EastEnders and uh, Coronation Street and these British soaps that we've got over here. Um, but if I start watching one or two, I end up thinking, watching the next one won't hurt because I want to know what happens next because <laughs> you've followed these humans' lives. And even though it's fake, you follow these humans' lives and you just want to know what happens next. You know, well, what's he going to do about that? What's she going to do? And you just need to know. So soaps know this. Storytellers know this. Um, Therapists don't often know or use this. Um, so it's a very useful technique to use is don't complete the pattern. Um, but in relation to the emotion part, if you dive in and you work on the thoughts, like most therapies do, most therapies will try and work on the thoughts, you don't hit the emotion that was underlying it because you don't hit the first stimulus. So you need to break that gap, that first pattern match point. You need to think, okay, where's what's caused this? And so seeing a, a diary that I'm about to give a talk makes me feel anxious. Okay. So what's the, what I prefer instead of anxious, excited. Okay. So how can I then link? So the therapy might be, how can you then link the, okay. So when you see that, so it's very good for post-hypnotic suggestions because, um, that's all a post-hypnotic suggestion is really is retelling the pattern in a way that's how the person's told you they'd rather have it happen. Um, so it's not going in and dictating to someone how you think that pattern should happen differently. It's you find out from them how they think the pattern should go differently. And then you tell them what they've told you. Um, 
as a post-hypnotic suggestion. And all it is is, okay, so when I see that uh, diary entry, I want to feel excited. And then I want to have thoughts saying, oh, I'm so excited, I'm looking forward to that. Is there anything I've got left that I need to do to prepare for it? Or, so whatever the thoughts happen to be, you want that in place instead. And then you want, okay, so what do you want next? Well, I want those thoughts to make me feel more excited. Um, obviously there comes a point you don't want to keep going up and up and up because you'll never cope in the talk if you're too excited you need to keep it contained um, likewise I've helped people improve art performance uh, doing artwork and things and again to do good artwork you need to make someone obsessive you need to make it so they see fine detail and they just can't stop helping themselves trying to focus on doing the work but you don't want them doing that all the time so you have to contextualize it and say only in this situation so uh, again, another important thing in therapy, make sure things are specific to the context. So I've done things like I gave someone uncontrollable laughter by touching the back of their knuckle. That went really well. They said, I want to keep that. That's really handy. I want to be able to, when I'm feeling a bit down, go and laugh. That's really good. Uh, the trouble was they went to a funeral and rubbed their eyes like, sort of like that <laughs> and burst out laughing in the funeral. So uh, this is an early case. Um, so not contextualizing it and saying, so when specifically do you want that to happen <laughs> meant that there was a risk it could happen in places that it wasn't necessarily the best place to happen. Luckily at funerals, people laughing uncontrollably sometimes is seen as, you know, oh, he's obviously just a bit hysterical. It's, it's fine. It's, you know, it, it happens. Yeah. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, it was something that we just found more humorous than anything else when he came back and told it and, um, but it taught me a lesson about making sure that even things that seem very good that you think, oh, who wouldn't want that anywhere? Mm. You know, even things like that, actually, you do have to check out where do you specifically want this? Um, if they choose to generalize it more after the session themselves, that's their business. But um, most things actually aren't helpful, like getting overly excited all the time may really irritate people, you know, like loved ones or something, <laughs> if you're constantly buzzing about one specific topic you know you you look in your diary you see that you've got a presentation come up and now you're buzzing and then the person comes in and you think I'm still buzzing from the seeing the diary entry <laughs> and you know they may think well, look can you focus on me for just five minutes be nice um so yeah you, know, you have to contextualize things don't uh don't generalize everything and just say oh let that happen anywhere it's uh, so it's even though you go through this whole pattern matching uh process You've got to look at it in context of therapy and what is the person actually there for um, when you give your suggestions to them, like post-hypnotically. Um, so obviously, as it says there, and as you were talking over there, the brain is a pattern matching machine. Um, that's all it really does. That is, it's pretty much its sole purpose is it notices things and it responds to them. And sometimes it lets you consciously know what's going on, uh, but not very often. Um, so you go through life, you walk, you don't think how you walk. As soon as you do start thinking how you walk, you feel like you walk really stupid and you get really uncomfortable and you feel self-conscious. So I've done um, TV programs where I've had to walk towards the camera over and over again. They say, walk naturally, straight past the camera. And so you try and walk naturally. <laughs> Had they just said walk towards the camera, you'd do fine. But because they've said walk naturally, how do you walk naturally? So you're just trying to think, how do I walk naturally? And, and you suddenly don't want to do your arms and your legs and you feel really uncomfortable. And, and then they say, no, do it again. And so you have to do it again and again and again, just walking and splitting off as you pass the camera. And, it's, and you feel really self-conscious and you can't do it. If only you just said walk towards the camera, we'd have got it right first time because <laughs> we... Don't have a problem walking normally, but now we're being told to. We're doing it hundreds of times over again. Um, so all the brain does is pattern matches and then takes those patterns, makes us behave off the back of those patterns, makes us feel things off the back of those patterns, gives us thoughts off the back of those patterns and makes us believe that we have some level of control over what goes on in our lives when we don't actually. Um, there's about a 200 millisecond delay between us making a decision unconsciously and consciously thinking, I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, and we then sort of almost a bit like we do with magicians, a magician will do a trick. And when you recall the trick, they make it, they've done it in a way that they've put emphasis on certain things. So when you recall it, you recall things in a different order to how the trick actually went. So from the outcome, you track back in your mind, Oh, I'm going to figure out how he did that. 
and you track back wrong because they placed emphasis on certain things. So you create a reality that didn't really happen, which makes magicians sound even better than they really are. So you, know, you see someone, um, the simple David Blaine thing, you see him levitate, and the people that really watch him levitate see him levitate about two inches off the ground. And they go, oh, it's scary, he's floating. And, um, and then you watch the footage back and see where he's been lifted up by a crane floating high in the air, um, where they've got people wearing you know, jackets looking similar to the people that are really there at the scene where he floated two inches. Um, and when those people are spoken to, though, they collectively start agreeing that he was like a foot off the ground or two foot off the ground, and it gradually gets higher and higher and makes him sound even more incredible more like the fake footage that they cut into it um when actually he all he did was rose up on one foot and from the perspective you're at it looked like he was two inches off the ground and so you think oh my god he's floating that's a magic and um so again the way you recall it and then pattern match backwards you end up creating the conscious experience of it is wrong whereas the unconscious experience normally just it's responsive it just happens you respond to reality as it is, and as I say, you occasionally get drip fed a bit of information just to make you feel like, you know, it's almost like the unconscious just thinks, just give him a little bit of a taster of what's going on. It'll keep him happy. He'll think he's in control. He's not really, but he'll think he's in control. Um, so you always think you're in control. You always think, I've got a neuroscientist friend who um, wired a bunch of women up and sent them into a shopping mall. And it was with, um, uh, Bluetooth brain scanning equipment and so he was able to track them on his laptop at the same time and he was able to look they had eye tracking software on so he could see where their eyes were looking brain scanning software on so he could see what was going on in their brain and he was able to say that person has just decided to buy that pair of shoes that she's seen in that window and then you'd see her suddenly decide to turn it over towards the shop and walk over to the window and then she'd look in the shop and look in the window and then eventually look at the pair of shoes she's decided to buy and then go in and then buy them and then be asked what made you decide well i walked over to the window i was just nosing around and i just walked over to the window just randomly and just looked and then eventually saw that pair of shoes and thought oh, they're nice and so i thought i'd go in and buy them but her brain showed she'd already decided to go and buy them before she walked over to the shop you know, out the corner of her eye, it, it showed that she saw the shoes. It showed a spike in her brain activity, in her reward centers in her brain that she really wanted them. All of that had gone on before she consciously had even decided to turn to the shop. So your brain is always doing that. Your brain is always operating and it's accessing that part of it that as a therapist is what you want to do. There's no point jumping in after things have happened. There's no point trying to cure a phobia like with exposure, for example, where you have the person terrified and you say, right, now let's, while you're terrified in this situation, let's try and make you feel good <clears throat> because they're already, the pattern started. What you're doing is trying to tag something new onto the end of a pattern. So what often happens with things like exposure therapy, some people obviously it works for, but most people tolerate whatever it is. They don't ever get used to actually doing it. They tolerate it because the bad stuff happens and all they've done is created a new bit of pattern on the end of the bad stuff. So the emotion leads to, now I have to tolerate staying in this situation. So they lead to new thoughts that try and lead to new emotions after that, but the beginning is still the same. So they have the same beginning, all they have done is learn how to control the end, um, which can be helpful, but it's not very lasting because it takes a lot of emotion, uh, emotion uh, no, a lot of strength, a lot of... Uh, resilience to be able to stick to doing that to be able to stick to doing a strategy every single time you're in a situation is a lot of hard work to do it's much better if you can nip the pattern in the bud in the first place and break that stimulus through to the first emotion and make a different emotion there first um, how you do that is obviously different depending on different people some people are very good at it and it depends on the level of emotion Sometimes it's actually easier with really strong emotions. So phobias are far easier to treat than a little niggling emotion. Because a niggling emotion, you can't get the client to get it strong enough really to work with um, to get that pattern. You know, you want the pattern, a bit like all the other hypnosis stuff, you want it as pure as possible. So you want that trance to be as pure as possible. So if you're going to access the pattern, you want to access the pattern, not access the pattern lightly where they're really trying to force it to be there. You want to be able to get just into the heart of it and get them to know it's there so they can actually work on it and do something with it 
Um, right. So would it be actually worth increasing the stress of a particular pattern in order to be able to deal with it in more Sometimes it is. Um, and again, every situation is different. As far as possible, I like to do therapy, making people ideally feel good. Um, but sometimes you can't get the pattern. You can't actually get to the emotion because the person maybe doesn't want to get to that emotion. And so when they, they know the pattern's there and they know in real life certain things trigger it, but in a therapy setting, which isn't real life, that trigger isn't there. So they're thinking about the trigger, but not actually having the real trigger there, but they know how bad it is for them. So they don't want perhaps, so sometimes it's bad for them, but not bad enough uh, for therapy to easily access it. Other times it's bad for them and it's terrible in the real situation, but in a therapy setting, because they know it's terrible in the real situation, they put that block in where they think, you know what, apart from thinking, you know what, I'd rather not go there. So I'm sort of almost going there and not. So it's a bit like, um, say, I can't sing. I'm terrible at singing. And I'd love to be able to just let go. I'd love to be able to just grab a microphone and just let go and become one with the singing. But because I can't sing, there's that block that makes it so that my voice it's all right, oh, and doesn't come out. It's like in my head, my voice is coming out. Of it. Where's the harp? Can't sing. Who cares? Let's just let it out. But then another part of me thinks, but don't. Just don't inflict that on everyone. So it stops it. So then nothing, nothing of substance comes out to the microphone where it says no sort of projection or anything. And, uh, and it's a bit like that, that sometimes it's like, you know what's, what it's going to be. You know it's going to be bad. So you just, a part of you holds it back. Even if another part of you is thinking, come on, just engage. Just do this. Just, this is therapy. Go with it. And it's like a part of you doesn't let you go with it. It's a bit like um, Jackie Chan did a stunt for, um, I think, the first police story film where uh, someone just had to slam their foot on the brake on the bus and they hesitated at the last minute. And the idea was they slammed their foot on the brake on the bus and the stuntmen upstairs on the bus go flying through the upstairs glass windows and um, land on a car beneath. But the stuntman driving hesitated, put his foot on the brake and then hesitated a bit and then put his foot down the brake again. But that hesitation meant the stuntmen got flung through the windows, but the bus wasn't, hadn't ground to a halt. Instead, it jolted and then slid back a step. And at the point it slid back a step, they went through the windows and landed on the road instead of on the car bonnets, which would have broken their fall, which is what they were supposed to land on. So they, because of the person hesitating, it just didn't, it wasn't a nice clean you know, they didn't just let themselves go. Um, and I think with all these things, back to Jackie Chan again, police story, he jumps and he grabs hold of the uh, electric cable and he slides down it and he scalded, burnt all the skin off his hands and he cut himself and um, had to crash through a glass cabinet at the bottom to break his fall. In the Western world, we use crash mats and things, but over there, glass cabinets and car bonnets. Um, he had to crash through the glass cabinets at the bottom and he had to carry on acting, carry on the scene and running. And um, he said the only way he managed to do it was by just screaming and getting himself psyched up so much he would jump. Because if he missed that wire, the only thing around it was empty shopping mall and marble floor. So he had to grab the wire and that was it. There was no, any mistake and he hit marble floor three stories down. Um, he had to grab that electric cable and... Uh, in the documentary where he talked about it, he said um, he would never do it. Now, as a grown up, he would never ever do it. As a early twenties, jumping at an electric cable three floors <laughs> up, crashing through glass and running on and carrying on acting when death is the only option if you miss. Yeah, <laughs> up for that. The uh, yeah, but he said now he's more grown up. He looks back and thinks, I don't know how I even psyched myself up to do it. But he literally said, roll the cameras, and then he stood there. And then when he was ready, he screamed, just to sort of like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to jump. And if he hesitated, he would have died. If he'd gone to jump and thought, nah, it's scary, he probably would have just fallen because he would have half done it and then not made it. Whereas he had to just get in that zone of it's all or nothing. There isn't an in-between. And I think that's the same with when you access patterns of a problem. It's sort of like you need to access it all or nothing. There's no point having you're partially accessing it, but they're holding back a bit. And until they're, it's fully accessed, they don't have to fully experience it. It can be done like on a TV screen or something similar to the rewind technique would be done. 
you can create dissociation and stuff, but they have to be sort of willing to go there, even if it may not be comfortable to go there. And it's sometimes you can have a lot of sessions to get to that point where actually it takes a lot of work for them to be ready for the therapy, so to speak. It's like, you know, there's an expectation on hypnotherapists that people come and see you and you just click your fingers and they're done. And you then say, right, next, and then you click your fingers and they're done. And you know, you're just magic and somehow this is how therapy works, that they've been to therapy for 20 years, but a hypnotherapist can click their fingers and the person's cured. So um, not actually the reality, which is hypnotherapists are like every other one of the therapists. You know, hopefully the form of therapy you do is fairly effective, but the reality is you are like all the other therapists. You're not a miracle worker who can click your fingers once and it's all done. You might be able to if the client says that's what they expect and something about it makes you think, you know what, actually, I think that that is actually what would work for you as a client, but that would be for that client in the same way that Ericsson did the treatment where he thought, I didn't know what to do as a client, so I just um, got her to close her eyes, hypnotised her, and then I shut up. And then when she opened her eyes, I said, that's right, and you can come all the way back now. And then when she said, I didn't hear you do anything, I said, that's right, you really didn't hear me do anything. But, but you must have done something. I said, that's right, I must have done something. Said, but you really must have done, but I don't remember anything. That's right, I really must have done, and you don't remember anything. And he just, he didn't do anything, but he just played into the fact that she believed he must have done something to the point where she left the session. What on earth did he do? I don't have any memory of it. And so she believed she just blanked out the experience because she didn't believe he would have just sat there silently for an hour. Um, but he actually just sat there silently for an hour. And um, she then overcame her own problem because that's what she needed. She needed someone not to dictate to her what you should and shouldn't do, but actually just to give her the space to do it herself because she was someone that would reject anything. If he'd said, do this, do this, do this, she would say yes and then not do any of it and not take it in con unconsciously. Um, so I think it's having that sort of, sometimes you do need to do that kind of thing. You know, sometimes you do need to do something where you do nothing. Um, but in most cases you have to do some sort of therapy. And uh, in most cases, in a fair few cases, people aren't ready for the therapy the second they meet you. You know, they're ready to come to therapy the second they meet you. They've psyched themselves up for that bit, but they've been preparing what they're going to tell you. So people come in with their story. They come in thinking, right, I'm going to have to tell him about when that happened to me because he's going to want to know about that. And what in my childhood happened? Because he's going to want to know all about my childhood. So I better remember all my childhood and ha all the bad stuff that's happened to me. And they come in fully prepared. They've rehearsed their story exactly how they want to tell you because they think that's what you're going to ask them. So if you then ask them about something completely different, you throw them and that's so new to them that they didn't, they only prepared themselves for the session. They haven't even prepared themselves for the actual therapy. They prepared themselves for, he needs all this information and, or she needs all this information. They haven't prepared themselves for the actual full on proper therapy. So when you then come at it from a different angle and you start talking about what the pattern is, or um, you start asking about what would you like? What do you mean, what would I like? I haven't thought about that. <laughs> I know what I don't want. I don't know what I like. I I definitely think the way you advertise is important. If you advertise trying to make yourself seem the best and seem like you can treat everyone in one session or something, people will come definitely with that expectation. And then if they don't get it, they will go and share how that didn't work for them. Um, I would say the reality is that most people will see progress within three to six sessions. If it's something like a phobia or something like that, it probably will be one session. And they'll be perfectly fine. Some people quitting smoking, if they're in that place where they're ready to quit and they're making the decision for themselves, not because a partner has told them to go and see you or something. Again, if they're at that place where they're ready to quit, if you do a few things like um, ideally test that by saying, I expect you to not smoke for a few days beforehand, so that if they genuinely want to quit, then they'll they'll follow what you're saying. Um, again, then you can do it in a single session. Um, um, and that is an important thing, is setting up the expectation in advance, setting up the focus, which is obviously you direct the brain through pattern matching. You set up the focus. You want to know what patterns they're focusing on. And if you can get them to focus on healthier, better patterns in relation to whatever it is that they're trying to achieve, you're going to have much better success. Um, but I would say that, Normally, if I don't start seeing results in about six sessions, then I want to know from the client whether it's working for them, whether they still want the therapy, because it may not be the right 
person it may not be the right therapy whatever it may not be the right approach maybe they need someone you know some people do need someone who's just very authoritative who says you know i will tell you what you're going to do and you're going to do it that's their upbringing they're used to that and that's what they want and that works for them and well, i'm not that sort of person so they probably work that's a bit too far outside what i'm likely to be like uh, i'm willing to be flexible but that's a bit too far outside what i would do so i just wouldn't do it. so they need to go to someone else it doesn't mean hypnosis as hypnosis doesn't work for them it doesn't mean the therapy part doesn't work it just means that what i offer wasn't right for that person but other people say to you you know what actually this is helpful it may not be the results we're wanting right now but it's helpful and i'd like more therapy um it's fair enough but it's about making sure clients have the choice not um necessarily sometimes i have said to clients no i'm not going to carry on working with you i don't think it's working i don't think it's right or but it's nice to have the client involved in that decision not an all or nothing thing um and it's so i think that it is about how you set it up if you go in and you are trying to make out that you're going to treat someone instantly even if it's you're doing that because you want to look good um, so you can get better clients or get more clients to come to you it's sort of pointless because you set yourself up to fail because although you probably will be correct in a lot of cases um, you'll also be wrong in a lot of cases and so it's better to give people a more balanced view of say three to six sessions and we expect to see reasonable results um, as long as it and then you talk about how it's an interaction between you and them it's not you do all the work as a therapist it's an interactive thing where you expect them to do their part and you do your part and you've got a bit to offer and they've got some to offer and, and if you're selling it as a collaborative thing and working together and um, you know it's not me I'm a wonderful therapist and I make you do this well you know, clearly that's not going to work and that type of approach isn't going to fit some people they might come to you because they want you to do that but not want that kind of therapy so they have this own conflict in their own mind of actually I want to go to somebody who can treat me in a session and just say yeah you're going to get better but then there are other parties I don't like people bossing me around and telling me what to do <laughs> so the two things conflict and then they come into you because they want you to tell them what to do and they don't want you to tell them what to do so <laughs> so they don't get better um so it's having that balance and I think I always I always just say three to six sessions I expect to see some sort of results and I think that's fairly realistic for most things um whether it's one-to-one -one sessions or even family therapy even that is i would say an average of six sessions um so even things that involve other people so that it's not as nice and cut and dry as you know i do some work you take on some things and you go and apply those things and then you get better even things where it involves other people you can get quite good results fairly quickly um but it's the expectation thing if you set it up bad and you even if you're trying to do it for the right reasons if you set it up Given it's better that, for example, even with phobias, it's better that someone comes in and they leave after a session feeling great, but they thought that it was going to be the second or third session feeling great, than they come in expecting to feel great in the first session and they sit down and it's a phobia that actually doesn't react how you thought it was going to go because there's always a spanner that will get thrown in the works eventually, um, that where you think something's going to be really easy and they sit down and they start and they think actually that's not as easy as I first thought and I saw this happen to Paul McKenna on I think, a TV show we got over here called The One Show um, he had confidently said um, to the presenters yeah tell your viewers anyone can contact us and next week I'll come back and I'll just treat them for their phobia it'll be fine I'll treat it on air and it'll be all fine and they came back and it was a simple sounding phobia. So it's one he'd accepted the challenge of because it sounded simple. And then when they came in and they started saying, I've got no idea how I got this. I can't think of a cause for it. So that was the rewind technique of fast phobia cure out the window. Um, I've got, um, I find it really hard to get the thoughts or the ideas of it in my mind while I'm sat in a, like a session like this. So again, it was like, well, now I can't even access them. So all of a sudden it was something that he didn't get any kind of success at all with it on national live TV because of the fact that it just turned out not to be what it looked like on paper at the beginning. So he would have seen, oh, fear of heights or whatever it was. Really simple, do that. Uh, and it turned out not to be as straightforward. Um, I had a fear of flying that somebody came to me with. And I said, um, so when did you first get this fear of flying? They said, um, 
I don't know. I haven't flown since having the fear of flying. So, so um, have you flown before? Yes. Uh, they came from Australia. We're living over here in the UK. Um, yeah, I flew, I flew from Australia over here perfectly fine. Um, how many times have you done that before? You obviously lived out there and lived, yeah, dozens of times, backs and forwards, perfectly fine. Had to stop off and it's lots of flights, backs and forwards. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so when did you first notice you had this fear? Um, when I first thought I've got to go back to Australia again. Well, when though? Have you been in a plane and had that feeling? No, I've never been in a plane because no, I'm scared of flying. So I've not been in a plane and they've never ever been in a plane since developing a fear of flying. So I had to use a technique which we'll learn um, of finding out when they did get that fear and then had to work on that. And it was, they got the fear going on the um, Eurostar, the train that goes under the channel uh, from Dover to Calais. And that was when they got their fear of flying. I never would have guessed that. And if mm. I was under pressure on a TV show to find that. <laughs> it's not um, something you can just call, is it? It's not no. something you're going to pull out of the air, is no. it? And they had never thought about it. And it wasn't until I did some techniques to find out where this feeling was so I could work on the feeling, hopefully associated with something. Um, and that took a set, whole session just to find it. Um, and yeah, it literally was. The doors shutting apparently are like plane doors shutting, that when they shut, they sort of make a sound like oh. an airlock kind of sound. And that made them think, oh my God, I'm trapped on here. It's like, and they, when they were telling me the experience, they said, I remember suddenly now looking back on it, thinking, oh my God, that's like when the plane doors shut and I'm trapped here now and we're about to go under the ocean. And if anything happened, I'm stuck and I could die. And they thought all that, but it was that one reference to aeroplane and the link to the aeroplane doors that made them then scared of flying, even though at that point they'd not been on a plane. At the point of getting the fear, they'd not been on a plane. And ever since having the fear, they'd not been on a plane. Um, so they matched their pattern very badly. Mm. Because he didn't bother him when he shut the door shuts on an aeroplane, but he no, did. No. And, and, and all of a sudden was, the pattern match yeah. has just gone crazy. And again, it came down to the, the, the strong feelings were so strong on the Eurostar that when they made the reference to an aeroplane whilst they were in that state, that was enough to link it and track it outwards to being on a plane. Even though it didn't happen on an aeroplane, they'd flown dozens of times perfectly fine, very long distances perfectly fine on aeroplanes probably experienced lots of turbulence and all sorts of other air issues that you would think might have caused people to have that and even the air the doors shutting they'd experienced but it wasn't a problem on a plane um, but it was the strong emotion in that situation suddenly thinking of aeroplanes made them link it to the aeroplane situation so having that metaphorical as we mentioned at the start the metaphorical pattern matching type of brain of um it's broad enough to apply to whatever your life is going to be when you're out in life after, you know, whether it's learning an African unusual dialect with things that we would find incredibly hard to even repeat um, because they don't match how we move our mouths or whatever, or whether it's English or something, whatever it is, the brain is wired ready for it to learn whatever that language is. And it's that clever. So it's, it's broad enough ready to pick up on whatever it needs to pattern match to. The downside to that is it's broad enough to then develop problems. And that's sort of the, you know, the trade-off we've got as humans, the trade-off is you're very flexible. You're able to adapt really well to lots of environments, whether it's um, figuring out how to use fire and then figuring out how to turn a stick with fire on into a bush with fire on and then figuring out how to cook meat on the fire and you know whether it's creating all these things we've created over thousands of years that's all very good and that's helped our survival but at the same time we've made mistakes as well and we've developed problems and uh, the reason that it still survives within us is because it's still very helpful if you hear a rustling bush it's better to err on the side of caution and think that maybe not so much nowadays, it's probably a rabbit or something, but you know, 10, 20,000 years ago, it's better to be cautious and think I'm keeping away from that bush and feel a bit of fear because you know that it could be a giant saber toothed tiger or something jumping out of that bush than to think, oh, let's go and look and see what's down there. Because the one that thinks, oh, let's go and investigate will probably die. Um, a bit like horror movies. 
The one that thinks, I just heard a noise coming from in that house. I'm going in to have a look, and I'm going to go all the way to the top floor <laughs> where there's no escape. And no, it's not switch no lights on. <laughs> I'm not going to touch a single light switch on my entire journey. <laughs> or take a mobile phone in there. I'm going to say, hold that while I go in. Um, or pick any weapons up. It's, yeah, they don't survive very well. Whereas the one that thinks, well, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I'm going to run. Yeah, they live, generally, um, unless it's Friday the 13th or something in which case they get caught up with and mm -hmm. Jason Voorhees manages to still get them, uh, even though they've been sprinting and he's been plodding along slowly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't make horror films like that nowadays, though. <laughs> horror films are full of lots of uh, special effects now. Then it was just a man in a mask walking along. And <laughs> Actually, uh, thinking of that, that is a very good way of looking at pattern matching mm. because when when uh, it's, it's what the film is implying mm. rather than, and you're, therefore you're expecting something to happen. They don't they need to show you a man having his cut, head cut off to, to scare you. It's implying that eventually he may have his head mm. cut off and you're matching the pattern. So it's mm. a very good way of matching the pattern is watching how they do mm. the horror movie. And obviously the whole suspense thing works off the back of the fact that you keep expecting something to happen and they keep not letting it happen. And then just when you let your guard down, because like the Yes set, the Yes set, which you're not going to learn right now, but you are because I'm about to mention it, um, of uh, you get a bunch of yeses and so the person just keeps agreeing with you um, as long as it's not too far out of their reason of what they're happy to agree with. So, um, oh, it's nice weather today. Yeah. Um, it rained last night. Yeah. There's a bit of thunder as well. Yeah. Um, and you're all here sat down yeah, and you're agreeing to all this and then um, and you'd like to relax and they may or may not like to relax but because it's tagged onto a whole bunch of yeses you go along with it but if so when you get someone in a flow like um, uh, oh he's about to jump out he's about to jump out no he didn't oh he's about to jump out he's about no he didn't oh he's about to jump out no he didn't he's not going to jump out ah there he is <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know once you get into this pattern of he's just not he's just not going to be there you know once you click on that pattern and then they suddenly throw out there the thing that you thought you were you know you're waiting for suddenly you stop waiting for it because you're now not expecting it and that's when they give it to you so so it is you know it's no different to a salesman using a yes set or something saying um oh it's nice weather would you like to come in and buy a car today um yeah they get you hooked and then they draw you in and then before you know it you're signing something and don't even realize why you're signing it if they're very good um and so they're using exactly the same technique. They're just using it in their own genre. They're using it for their own thing, whether it's sales or whether it's a horror movie or, um, you know, when you read a book, that'll do it as well. That'll have you constantly come to a perceived conclusion that perhaps either happens or doesn't happen, but it means that you then make a judgment for the future conclusions when that pattern's matched again. Um, and obviously in therapy, it's very useful as well. Is um, You don't necessarily have to say something to get a message across. So you can keep talking about something, keep coming back to something that triggers the same pattern. Um, like if somebody, parenting is quite a good example because parents see things as failure that are actually successful. Um, so they will walk away when they've had enough and they've given up and they can't think of what else to say. And then the child will shut up because they've walked away and they've stopped arguing with the child. Um, but they saw it as failure. So you can bring them back a bit later on. Like, oh, it's really interesting how that, instant turned out and then just carry on talking and, and all you've done is reminded them of a pattern so you've not very overtly told them well what you need to do is what you just did then that actually worked for you you just remind them of the pattern and then every now and then keep reminding them of the pattern so the pattern keeps being re-stimulated um, now I'm about to show you a picture and on the backs of your paper or on your pad or whatever I'm only going to show you this briefly and I'd like you to just write down as much as you can that you notice on this picture. It's as simple as that. Let's write down as much as you notice on this picture. Can you see the picture? Yeah. Right. Write down as much as you notice. Well, you've all actually been far more observant than statistically is normal, which is good. Um, statistically, 2% of people notice the, um, the woman. And that's it. 2%? Yep. Yeah. 
statistically only 2% of people notice the woman falling. Um, in fact, more people notice that that says sandwich is $10 or whatever it says um, than notice the woman falling. And people normally say what the sky looks like. Which obviously you can't see. isn't in the picture. Uh, they normally describe the pavement in detail, like the type, like cobbled streets and stuff. Even though that's also not in the picture. Um, and what this picture in psychology experiments, what it's used for, is to show that you notice patterns that you expect to see based on that type of scene, and you include extra patterns that you expect to see even because you think they should be in the scene even if they're not like when i said the world doesn't look great how could i tell from there mm. it could be a perfectly sunny day yeah um so people pick up on these even though they're really small um so one saying milkshakes and sandwiches um they pick up on those because they expect those to be on a coffee shop and so they find that really easy to notice it and recall it. Um, they do normally pick up the hotel sign and the free garage um, and the 100 up or whatever. Um, they normally pick up that there are people inside. Um, they miss the woman. But they normally miss the woman because they don't expect that in that picture. And with this, it was, I think, 2.2% of people of all age ranges saw the woman uh, or made a reference to the woman. So it didn't necessarily say it was a doll or whatever. They made some kind of reference um, when they first did it. So that's out of hundreds and hundreds of people. When they told a story beforehand relating to a woman being sad and down and stuff, 25% of people noticed, which is still very low but it's a huge leap up versus 2.2%. Um, and for years, this has been used in psychology experiments as a way of seeing how perception works and how you see what you expect to see and you are blind to what you don't expect to see in your reality. So it's quite a good way of, uh, and I thought it was better than the gorilla one because everyone knows about the ones with the gorillas. Um, if there's a gorilla there, you'd instantly know it's got to be something to do with the gorilla. Um, so you you end up seeing, although the gorilla ones are quite good, like you know, count the balls, how many times the balls pass between each other, and um, at the same time a gorilla strolls on and waves and dances, and yeah, and people just don't notice the gorilla. Um, but they did things like they pointed out how big she is compared to, say, these signs, um, how the person's right in the centre of the entire image, and yet still goes gets overlooked um, and uh, yet if your brain is set up for the pattern of noticing then you are more likely to notice it um, and that's the, the whole point obviously in therapy is if you set someone's brain up with the idea of noticing a pattern or a different way so you set tasks or you um, give ideas about um, say preset and change which we'll cover tomorrow I think uh, where you say, uh, so between now when you've made the phone call and when you come out to your first session, I'd be really curious for you to notice um, what's already begun to go, how you'd like it to go, or what's already going, how you'd like it to go within your life that you wouldn't want to change. So that when we talk about it, you just sort of do it so it's quite conversational. Yeah? So, so when we talk about it, um, you're able to tell me the bits you don't want changed. So getting back to family therapy type things. It could be, I want him to stop doing this, this and this, but it could be, well, actually, he's a really lovely child. He really, you know, he helps his grandmother out a lot. And I want those, I want those qualities to stay there. I don't want him to become a completely different boy. So it's, you know, you can normally find a way of getting that kind of conversation in there and get them to say, get them to focus on some of the good stuff. And often once they start doing that, that actually builds up even more good stuff. So because they've started noticing good stuff, they start thinking, oh, things have actually already started to improve. Well, all they've been doing is noticing things that are already there. It's only their belief now that things are already improving because nothing has. It's it's the same stuff. There's, there's nothing new going on. Um, so, but it's quite a good um, 
I picked it hoping that none of you would have seen uh -huh. it. Um, so. And then it comes down to what your perception of simple is, because some things are simple when you know them, and not like, um, you know, there's obviously the, it's definitely a common thing over here, the whole sort of being reluctant to pay a plumber vast amounts of money when they spent about three minutes in your house. <laughs> uh, and all they did was went out. Uh -huh. that easy yeah it was only that easy because I've got the knowledge to know exactly what I'm doing it's, yeah yeah it's yeah. you know some things can seem really simple and you're like I could do that yeah yeah but you can't do that if you don't know that's what you need to do yeah <laughs> so I it's just went through that with my yeah. so some things are really simple but at the same time they're uh so the trick is to remember that it's not simple without that knowledge mm. Mm. and even things as simple as um you know, think about good stuff instead of bad stuff. It's obviously a simple thing. It's obviously known that it helps, but it's not easy always to do. Mm -hmm. It's not easy for people to suddenly think, okay then, so from start, I'm going to think good stuff only. It doesn't happen. Most people struggle to suddenly think good stuff, even if they know that's the simple, easy answer. That's what they've got to do. Just because it's a simple, easy answer doesn't mean it's a simple, easy thing to end up doing. Um, and that's why sometimes it's about how you phrase it. So part of the the simple bit is actually the, how are you going to phrase this so that they do take it on board enough to at least give it a go, uh, you know, give it a try. So getting someone to do a task can be really challenging. Milton Erickson had people climbing mountains and all sorts, but you know, most people, if you say climb a mountain between now and the next session, yeah, right. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I'll tell you I've climbed a mountain, but I'm not going to do it. Um, but people did it for him and it, you know, how he conveyed it. He would convey it in such a way that people would think, yeah, okay, then I'll do that. But he would learn a lot based on whether they did it or not as well. So when people don't do things, it's all just information. If someone doesn't do something, that's perfectly fine. That's Maybe that's just their way of doing things. You learn something about them and how they're going to respond to what you choose to do next based on whether they did things. So if you've said to somebody between now and when you come in, can you just notice some things that uh, are going how you'd like them to continue going? Just so that we've got some things that we can talk about that we know are sort of a base baseline of what we don't want to change as well as what we do want to change and you normally sell the idea in some way to people but if they come in and say oh no I didn't do that it was two days ago I asked you it's not like it was you know a month ago and you had time to forget you know, how can you forget in two days and I said no I just didn't do it and so you think well, that's taught me something that's taught me you're not going to do things even something where you don't have to do anything other than observe because there's different types of tasks you can set. You can set ob observational tasks. So I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm just going to ask you to feed back on what you've noticed about something. Um, or there's actual sort of fairly active doing -y kind of tasks, which to get someone to do something is far harder to get someone to, than to get someone just to notice something. It's much easier for someone to think, oh, I'm in the therapy session tomorrow. I suppose I better notice if there's anything good going on. Because <laughs> yeah, he's only going to ask me, so I better look. And they can notice something that evening because they know tomorrow morning you're going to ask them about it. So at least they did it, even if it was at last minute. You know, people leave homework to the last minute and all sorts, so it's not surprising. But if you say something difficult, could be family meals. You know, I want you to have a family meal every night. You're saying that's really important to the family and that if you did that, that would make a huge difference to your family. So between now and next time, try and at least three nights of the week, try and have a family meal together. They'll come in and they'll tell you they didn't do it. And that was a much bigger task for them to ever achieve because they had to actively go out of their way, manage to convince a whole bunch of other people to come and do something with them. And it's, you know, it's really hard work. It's, uh, so you, there's a whole range of things you can set. And if you miss the mark and you set something that actually, I like the idea of blaming myself more than the client generally with my what I've chosen to do. So if they haven't done it, the question is, did I set something that was far too out of their ballpark of what, they're at this point in time reasonably willing to do. Um, so a smoker might say, I want to quit smoking. And you notice they smoke because of stress. And so your thing is, well, clearly you need to be able to handle stress before you quit smoking. Because if you quit smoking, you haven't figured out how to handle stress. Your brain is going to say, look, smoke, because I don't like the stress. So your brain is going to fall back on the pattern it knows, which is the smoking. It's practiced that, it's mastered that, it knows what it's doing with that. It would be stupid to try and wing it and figure out a new thing. It, it will go back to what it knows. So learn a new technique for managing stress and then quit smoking. And if they're not willing to learn the new technique and they think, no, I just want to quit smoking. I don't want to learn new techniques or anything. Then you're just, 
you know, you're fighting an, an uphill battle the whole way. So you have to think, you know, I'm the one making the mistake here. I'm the one that's pushing, trying to get them to do something that they're not ready or in a place yet to do. So I need to step back, take things slower and start somewhere else. And um, I like to think of it a bit like chaos therapy. That obviously in chaos theory, the idea is that even the smallest change can lead to a vastly different outcome. So you can predict the weather really well short term, generally, but the longer time goes on, you can't predict it to enough detail. So as long as there's more detail available than you've predicted to, you can't predict it in enough detail to ever be accurate the longer term you go. So you know, someone walking down the street creates air pressure around them and creates a sort of vortices around them. That then creates um, changes to the air around that, which creates changes, and it gradually spirals out of control. And you've got millions of people doing that all around the country. So, and you've got billions of people doing that all around the world. So the chances of predicting the weather accurately enough, you'd have to take every particle into consideration and what every particle is doing where every particle is at any given moment and then build from there to the future and know what decisions everyone is going to make to be able to do that and that's just not going to happen so the advice in chaos theory obviously the idea is a small change a small shift in the starting position can lead to a vastly different outcome in the future in therapy a small shift in the starting position because you've created a small shift can lead to a vastly different outcome and as a therapist all you want is to nudge it in a positive direction so doing something like nail biting you know, if you're going to bite on your nails so you have one favorite nail or something that you like to chew on um really unfair on the other nails if you're going to do it to one do it to the others so something as simple as that if they agree to it all of a sudden it's tedious because now they bite one and have to start gnawing on the rest of them because it's suddenly something they've agreed to and, and that might be too big a step it could be um how long do you bite on it for? Oh, I bite on it for 18 seconds. Okay, do it for 20 seconds. Really make sure you give it a good go. Don't undersell it. Make sure you give it a good go. Do it for 20 seconds. That two second difference could be enough to mean that it tips it from being an unconscious act to being made more conscious. That means that it now becomes something tedious because they become aware of the time that they're doing it and they become aware of the fact they are actually doing it. They're now doing it in, with intent instead of doing it without thinking and so all you're doing is trying to tip the balance so that even the smallest shift um i worked with an alcoholic and uh he it was his dad who got said he has to see someone he didn't want to quit drinking i said well, i'm not going to stop you then but you, know, you need to make use of this time so would you be willing to try an experiment there's a you drive you cycle and his push bike with a basket on the front. You cycle round to the shops, you get two bottles of vodka, you cycle back home, you then go up to your flat, you drink the two bottles of vodka, you pass out, you come to, you do the same again. That's what you do. There's a pub between you and the shops. Why don't you go there? It's closer. So I said, you know, can't you go to the pub and just drink five pints instead? Just gulp them back, you know, five pints. If you want to go out and get two bottles of vodka after that, feel free to do so. Now, as a spirit drinker, clearly pints were going to make him feel really bloated and really sick and really horrible. And, and it was all going to kick in. You're going to need the toilet a lot because it's a lot of liquid. And, um, and I knew that, but he didn't think this through. And so he just, well, fair enough. I'll, I'll go to the pub and have a bunch of pints before I go and get drunk on vodka. <laughs> so I'm happy with that. If, you know, you're a therapist and you're telling me to get drunk, I'll do it. He didn't have any problem with that. So he accepted it really willingly because I was saying, you drink. Feel free. I'm, you know, everyone else is saying don't drink, and I'm saying fair. If you want to drink, drink, but at least you know, let me in a bit. And he quit drinking because he kept feeling so sick he couldn't get himself to go out on his bike again after he drank five pints. And so he just said nothing. Oh, I now, can't do it. Are you adding hypnotic suggestion work? No, to I, that. No, I literally just talked to the most hypnotic was the fact that obviously we were engaged in conversation and. Uh, I was presenting the ideas to him in a way that made sure he was engaged enough to listen and to think through the logic I wanted him to think through. So not think through sensible logic, which is, yeah, but that's going to make me feel really sick. And I don't want to feel sick. I want to get drunk. And uh, So what stops him from saying, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to just go back to my original. He had agreed to it and he was happy to agree to it. He knew his dad wanted him to be in therapy. He bought into the idea I was telling him to drink. 
and for him it just seemed to work. Other another person might think that. And but, you also have the situation when when you tell someone don't do it, mm. you're immediately going to people. I mean, Dan used the example with me last year. He said, "If I tell you not to think of a pink elephant, what's the very first thing you think of? It's a pink elephant. If I tell you not to drink, the first thing you're going to do is I want to drink." Mm. So it's again, it comes back to pattern matching again. You, you in, Dan changed the pattern from having two bottles of vodka, just right cycling down, picking up two bottles of vodka and driving back. The pattern's now changed. So the whole effect, you haven't been told you can't drink. But the only way to convince him of it was to make sure it seemed logical enough that he was being told he can drink, he wants to carry on drinking. So I'm agreeing with him and not his dad. Um, he's been given the logic that it's closer than the shop. So he's getting the drink quicker, easier, less exercise, and all these things that make it sound a bit more appealing that he'd not thought about. So everything was swinging it so that he saw it as a good decision and something more along what he was more more in line with his thinking, his feeling, and his behaviour and what he wanted to do, rather than how his dad would prefer. So it was almost like I was siding with him on it all and not going against him. So suddenly it's like, oh. You're a, you're a therapist, that's cool. You're agreeing with me and letting me drink. And I can tell my dad, and my therapist lets me drink, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So everything was his, almost like it was harder for him to then get out of it and change his mind. And, and he kept on following. I think on some level he knew it was good for him. He knew it was working because he eventually stopped going to the pub because he just thought, well, I can't be doing right, that. Right, so that's the, how you know that step will happen. Mm. He's also not been told you've got to quit because none of us want to quit no, doing anything. I never told him to quit. And that's the thing, he had to do that learning. He had to discover that a change was happening that he wanted to keep, that he could actually live with. Um, so I've done other things, obviously, with alcoholics, like getting them to water plants and things and look after plants as a way of making them feel in touch with looking after something other than themselves. If you have to take responsibility for something else and not you and put your mind on something else instead of yourself, suddenly that's a completely different type of mindset to, well, I only have me to think about. So if I want to go and get drunk, who cares? There's only me. It affects. It doesn't affect anyone else. And obviously, if there's no one else around for it to affect, if this that person specifically liked gardening and um, hadn't done it, again, if someone living in flats, um, he hadn't done gardening for years, but had enough room to put a window box. So uh, get some plants and try and keep them alive. And every time, all I want to do is when I come back, I'm going to ask how the plants are and I'm going to look. And so there's a bit of motivation of, I really can't show him some sticks sticking in, in a window box. So, so there's a bit of motivation there without talking about the motivation. There's sort right. of, you know, he, he couldn't really show me sticks in a box. He had, you know, he's going to want to show me plants. So um, as long as I stuck to my side of the bargain of I'm going to keep asking you about it, without saying I'm going to keep asking about it, I just ask him about it all the time and so it becomes habit he's got to stick to his part of watering them enough, which means he's got to put his attention at least some of the time on something else. And, and it is that sort of how can you make the smallest possible shift in a pattern that's going to mean the pattern now has to begin to spiral in a different direction. Because um, you've no longer got the same pattern. Mm. The emotions that are generated by it are different. Mm. You know, it's not just a matter of wake up, get drunk, fall mm. over. It's now a matter of wake up, tend the plants. Mm. Yeah, okay, get now drunk and fall over. Get yeah. drunk and fall over. But you've had to interrupt your pattern mm. in order to go and tend the plants. I don't care about that. That's absolutely I like them not to believe it's me. As yeah. far as possible, I like my idea of perfect therapy is where clients think, I don't need to see you because I don't have a problem. And they 100% think, I just got over it myself. Part of it depends what type of problems you focus on, or if you don't focus on problems at all. You know, if you focus on success and things like that, clearly they're more likely to end up attributing stuff to you because they've come to see you for that purpose and then they've got better. Whereas things like depression, anxiety, phobias, phobias normally are treated so quick that it's hard not to attribute it to you. Um, but any, any emotional problem is quite nice when they're self-reliant afterwards because half the problem is normally that they don't believe in themselves and believe that external agencies are always the thing that have the healing power. So they take a pill to get better. They go and see a doctor to get better. They go and, you know, it's always, I have a problem. I have to find someone that can help me with it. And you want them to be thinking, I have a problem. What am I going to do about it? 
and it's it's sort of like what kind of mindset do you want people to have um it's not good for business when everyone gets better and doesn't attribute it to you but they use the words that you know that are the same words you used when you help them um but at the same time it's what you want as a goal for them to be able to lead a better future and my experience is that although they don't attribute they the number of people that will say um yeah, it didn't really work for me because I got over my problem myself, so I stopped needing to go. But I really recommend you should go and see him because he's really nice. And, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so they end up sending people to you, even though they end up telling the person, um, yeah, it didn't work for me, I just got over my problem. And you know half the people they talk to think, well, you suddenly changed. <laughs> so, yeah, I need to save energy now. Yeah, my thing does that sometimes. You see, and also family members also recognise the change while you're seeing someone. So you give yourself... The, the, the benefit of the doubt that you got over it yourself mm. but your family say yeah but don't forget you were seeing Dan Jones at the time mm. yeah yeah he did help we, and, and, and then they can in, in, they incorporate you into but it's quite nice to make it so that they minimise as much as possible your involvement um, and I, like I also like the two alcoholic cases I've just mentioned I never once tried to consciously force them into a position of seeing that link of how they're getting better I just kept going back and seeing them until they didn't need to see me anymore and never said, so, do you notice how when you go round there and when you get drunk at the pub and then you come back and then you feel really sick and then you feel, I just feel too bloated and sick to go round to the shop. Do you notice how that is a change? There's no point doing that because they'll instantly, think, oh, you're trying to con me then, aren't you? You're trying to, so they build up a barrier and it gets messy and it's all, it's easier just to go around and say how things have been going and, um, oh, it sounds like things have been going quite well then. So you, you know, you've been drunk a couple of times, and it's easy just to keep focusing on things and not. They know things. You know that they know things. There's no point going there after that. It's like you know, um, in therapy, if the person sits down and they really want to keep their problem completely private, as you talked about the other day, um, they know why they're there. You know why they're there. Do you need to talk about it again? If you all know why you're all in that same room you don't need to necessarily address it again very overtly. You don't have to go and say, well, you're here because of this and you don't have to necessarily talk about it. So there's a lot of problems where actually, as long as you all are in the same, on the same page, beyond that, you don't have to keep coming back to it because you all, you already know that. You already know this is what it's about. So an alcoholic, you've set a task. They know everything you're doing and saying is therapy. That's why they're seeing you. For therapy they're not seeing you just for a nice chat they're seeing you for therapy so whatever takes place under the context of therapy must be therapy even if they don't necessarily see it as that consciously they know this is the whole reason you're there you know that's why you're there they know that's why you're there they know that if you've told them to do something never mind how nice it sounds for them as being on their wavelength instead of against them it must be therapy on some level it's got to be because or else you wouldn't be suggesting it or saying it or going there so the treatment eventually just starts happening because you've just you all know what you're there for yeah you know, you the the pattern is i'm here as a therapist so so you already know that so it's like you can forget about that consciously um and i know some therapies focus a lot on you've got to make the unconscious conscious to get things better and erickson's view was if something's unconscious it's probably unconscious for a reason so unless it spontaneously becomes conscious because the unconscious decides it's going to become conscious don't go out of your way to force it to be conscious. Um, I know somebody whose wife stutters uh, when she gets really anxious and um, she started stuttering. And his view is once someone's aware of something, they can stop it instantly because they're aware of it. So he said to her, you're stuttering, so you can stop now. And she started stuttering more because now she's aware of it and she was tripping over her words even more because her attention. And so he kept saying, no, you're, you're stuttering. I've told you so you can stop. And so she started stuttering even more and he was getting more and more frustrated. And I said, just focus on something else. If she's stuttering because of getting anxious and nervous, focus on helping her to be calm and relaxed. Don't focus on the stuttering. Don't even mention the stuttering. Don't even go there. It will begin to vanish itself by how you choose to guide her attention and what she's choosing to focus on when it begins to start. So if you notice the stuttering starting, begin to relax yourself more around her, begin to emphasize relaxation and, and once he started doing that obviously that means that she doesn't feel threatened she naturally starts to relax and so it's what patterns do you want to convey to someone um, but anyway we're going to stop for some food 
and then we're going to do an exercise in pairs. <laughs> 